It's setting up. <laughs> I'm on right now. All right, thank you. All right, we are back, and I do apologize again. So, um, again, we are with Kenzie, Councilor Kenzie Bach from District 8, and we'll continue this conversation. So, again, everyone, we do apologize for the um, issues. So, um, as we were talking before, we was, I was asking you about um, uh, what were some of the issues you were having during certain goals and issues that you were having during this crisis. So if you want to continue with that, that'd be great. Oh, yeah. Well, I think I was saying just before the crisis, you know, we had, I had just been planning, I'm the Council's Ways and Means Chair. And so I had just been planning, you know, this super participatory budget process. And then suddenly, you know, we, COVID hit and all of our hearings had to move to Zoom and we couldn't do, you know, a bunch of the things that I had hoped to do. So that was definitely an adjustment. Nice, nice. So next question to the city response to COVID-19, what were some of the first major actions the city of Boston took in response to the crisis and how has the city response evolved, evolved over time? Yeah, so I mean, you know, I think that for the city, you know, the biggest early decision was closing the schools. Um, and, and I think that that was really hard. That was a conversation. Obviously the mayor needed to make that decision, but it was a conversation that all the council was in. Um, and I think, Everybody, everybody knew what a big impact that would have on so many of our families. Um, I mean, you and I were just talking before the break, but you know, to, to have your kid come home and be home all the time, it changes your whole world. And, yes. and, we've, got, and we've got some people whose work um, is flexible in a way that enables that, even if it's still really hard, but we've got some people who it really doesn't. And so everybody knew that once you, once you did that, you were gonna affect the whole city in this really dramatic way. But it was just one of those things that had to happen um, because we we had to we had to freeze this thing in its tracks as much as we could. Um, and so, uh, you know, I think that that was obviously an early move. I mean, I think about this crisis as sort of in a series of stages. And what's weird is that they all kind of overlap. Um, right. I mean, there's that initial moment of we need to stop the spread and handle the surge. Right. So it was like, stop the spread. And then we've already got all of this spread cresting. And so we know our hospitals are going to be hit. And so it's how do we handle the surge? That was setting up Boston Hope, which was an amazing achievement. Um, really give the mayor's staff and uh, Sheila Dillon a lot of credit there and the and the labor unions who built it like overnight. Um, and, you know, and it's really exciting this week that the mayor's been able to announce that they're going to mothball it for now because we don't need that capacity anymore. But but we really did. Right. So it was and we benefited from learning from other cities that part of what you needed were these step down beds um, for people who didn't couldn't go home yet, but weren't at critical care level. Um, so, you know, so you're stopping the spread, you're handling the surge, but then you also have to meet people's basic necessities. Right. And so that was I mean, um, the the food access piece has been huge. My office has been trying to help with that as much as we possibly can because people need to eat and then people need shelter, right? And so there are a lot of the early Im immediate response was trying to make sure that no one was gonna get evicted, that people who didn't have shelter had shelter, right? And just to try to move to those basic necessities. But that's sort of, to me, that's stage one, two, three, right? Mm -hmm. Stop the spread, handle the surge, get people their basic necessities. Stage four is the, how do you start to, rebuild and plan for, you know, and plan for an economic recovery. And then stage five, and this is really where, you know, this is where the greater Boston Dems come in is, you know, I mean, how do you, how do you change our society in a way that like all of these, all of these deep, I mean, inequities, but I, I want a word that's stronger than that. I mean, injustices really, right. That have been exposed by the crisis. How do you, how do you have, a society as we come back from this that that actually you know changes some of those so that we're not we're not where we are exactly okay next question what communities in district a have been most impacted by the spread of this virus um i mean you know 
people in all pockets of my district and all parts of the city have been heavily affected. I think, I think like everyone, I worry a ton about our seniors. Um, and one of our big concerns early on were seniors whose first language is in English, um, because, you know, it's just, I mean, the city, the city did a great job early on of translating a bunch of materials, but it's just the, you know, the lion's share of the information getting pushed out in all channels, including media, it was disproportionately right English language. And um, I've got a bunch of Spanish speaking seniors in my district. I've also got a bunch of Chinese and Russian speaking seniors in my district and, and figuring out how do you get them the information they need? And then how, how do you get them the things they need? And, and, and how do you help seniors deal with the fact that like many of our elders are fiercely independent, right? And they're used to being able to take care of themselves and they, and they still can in sense of physically, and maybe some of them have the means as well economically, they're on a fixed income, but it's like now really important for them to minimize trips out, right? And and also they're, you know, they need, we're all trying to minimize social um, engagement, but that means a lot of social isolation. So, um, you know, like my, my office, we've had a ton of volunteers calling through all the seniors in the district um, and making, getting a bunch of people to do other language calls. And so seniors, definitely a big concern. And then I think on the food access side, what I saw is just the people who, we already had a food access problem in the city and the people who were on that edge went more over that edge. And a lot of the systems that folks relied on, the food pantries, the volunteering through fair foods, all kind of temporarily sort of rolled up right when the crisis hit because of the concern about volunteers getting sick. And, and that was really brutal. That was, that was. Um, so according to the city of Boston website, the rental relief fund has closed applications for this round of funding. And there is an indication that there will be a second round of funding. Do you know when that might happen? And if so, are there other resources through the city or housing organization that you would recommend to folks experience housing instability right now? Yeah, so a couple of thoughts on that. So first of all, I do expect there to be another round. We, the city council approved some um, CDBG, which is Community Development Block Grant, additional emergency funding. Uh, we approved 10 million of that uh, a few weeks back. And I know that DND intends to use some of that for another round. Um, I mean, the critical thing that happened, right? And I wanna say this because we're on air for people to just know, right? Is that right now you cannot get evicted in the state of Massachusetts and nobody can move forward. You can't get a notice to quit. There's, we, we passed the strongest eviction moratorium law in the country, right? And that was something I can't take credit for it. It was at the state house level, a whole bunch of people worked really hard on it. Um, at the city council, we urged them to do it, but it, you know, it's really important for people to understand that like that whole apparatus is frozen right now. So just if it doesn't, you know, doesn't mean that we aren't going to need to figure out what we do to prevent a wave of evictions from happening when the emergency lifts, but it's important for us for people to have that peace of mind. And when the fund first got stood up, the rental relief fund, people didn't have that peace of mind yet. So that was why it got put together really quickly. I think the department learned a bunch of lessons through that process. And, you know, the biggest issue is how do you target that support to the folks who most need it, and especially the folks who are least able to access other means of support right now. So for instance, we've got some workers who have been able to access the $600 bonus in unemployment, and they got their CARES Act $1,200 check. And you know they're still in a state of anxiety because we all are, but they're in a much better state than someone who has an undocumented family member and isn't getting any of those things or somebody who works in the informal economy and can't really file for unemployment. And, you know, so, so one of the, one of the things we always have to think about at the city is, and that we've had to think about a lot in this crisis and it's really hard is you just have this avalanche of need, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we have to be clear, like we need, we need the federal government to just like step in in a huge way because they're the ones who have the resources to like meet that scale of need. And, and there is this awkward dynamic where, you know, I mean, I'm, we're, you know, overseeing the city budget process and we're waiting for the state to decide how it's going to help the cities and towns. And the state is waiting for the feds to decide how they're going to help. And I can't say I have a ton of faith in um, leadership in Washington, at least not on the, on the executive side. But, um, but in the meantime, what we have to do at the city is think about like, okay, we have this smaller pool of resources, but how do we target them, right? Like how do we target them to help the people who are not being helped through these other channels? Um, and to really, and to really like 
make the difference for people, right? So that initial rental relief was about how do we make sure people don't get evicted? And now that we've paused evictions, you know, it's about, again, thinking about who's not getting access to any of these other sources. I would definitely say, because you asked the question and I'll stop, but just if people, if somebody is in a housing insecure situation right now, they should call Boston's Office of Housing Stability. They should, they should call it a great team there. People will work on, I mean, both letting you know when the second round of the rental relief thing is open, but also pairing you up with other resources. Um, and I'll say, I've been, I, I've been, I've been part of and hugely encouraged to have a lot of allies in really trying to push to house our, um, our families in shelter right now. Um, and there's, there's a lot of work going on on that front. Yeah. Uh, so the small business relief fund has run out. Will there be additional city funds in the future for that? And if not, what else is the city going to support for small businesses? Yeah, so um, so again, the council, the council, so some of that CDBG money we approved, and then we also approved um, $120 million of CARES Act money. Um, and both of those, both of those are potential resources for some more funding for our small businesses. Um, what the mayor announced this week was a reopening fund to help small businesses um, with the expenses related to reopening. And that's really meant for, you know, it's just like all our small locally owned mom and pops for whom saying, oh, just go order dividers, right? For your, you know, for your barber chairs or, oh, just go get a bunch of masks and a bunch of hand sanitizer. It, it becomes a sort of prohibitive expense, especially when you're not sure exactly, you know, what your rate of clientele will look like and that kind of thing. So, so that's where, again, the city is trying to step in to help that, ecosystem that we all rely on right and that disproportionately did not access the ppp payment protection right funds at the federal level like trying to try to help those folks get back on their feet yeah so which goes into my next question which you have brought about the cares act can you give us an idea how that money may be spent and how does that grant money affect the city's budget process yeah so i mean so that money is useful but it's not perfect because um, it's the way they wrote it in Washington, they made it really specific that you had to use your CARES Act money on things very much related to the public health emergency. And you're actually explicitly not allowed to use them on things that you had in your regular budget from before the emergency. So, so you can't be like, oh, we need a lot more of this, right? Or like, I want to employ more you know, more folks to do whatever, like kind of that regular just expanding or replacing revenue because, hey, we lost a lot of excise taxes when all the hotels closed and restaurants had to go to takeout only, right? You can't just pour it, you can't backfill your city budget with it, which is tough for us. And, on, and that's what we're waiting on from Washington and from the state is revenue replacement so that we can do the normal things that we have to do all, they're normal things, but we have to do them all the more right now. Um, so the stuff that we can use the CARES Act money for is, I mean, definitely things like, you know, building the Boston Hope Hospital, right? Or like the city's, the public health commission's work supporting contact tracing, like that kind of thing. Um, I think she froze for a second. Hold on one moment. Oh, I lost you for a second. Yes, there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry. Like, One moment, so you you're fine. <laughs> okay, yeah. Um, you know, I think there are things that create like I mean, summer programs are super in the air, but we know there's a lot of safety that we need to put in place to have anything. And we know we might need to, you know, employ more young people to tutor other young people, like that kind of thing when you frame it in terms of the public health crisis and these additional expenses, you can use CARES Act money, um, certainly for accessing things like, you know, getting all these additional computers so that students can do remote learning. So I would say, um, you know, and then, I mean, the food access stuff, right, that we've hugely ramped up. But one of the things the city is trying to be very strategic about right now um, that I spend a lot of time thinking about and that the city budget office spends a lot of time thinking about is like, how do we how do we use the maximum amount of the um, the CARES Act money and then also FEMA? There's some disaster relief money, and how do we access that for all these extraordinary extra costs 
so that we save our remaining regular budget revenue for all that regular work of the city that is so important now. I mean, you think about you think about making streets safer and the work of the transportation department. You think about, um, I mean, all the supports that we need in our schools, the social workers, like, I mean, it's just, uh, we need our city workforce um, doing their jobs more than ever. That is correct, that is correct. Um, so the next question is, what kind of coordination is there between the city of Boston and the state, as well as the federal government? Has there been any really real coordination beyond Boston? Um, yeah, there's a lot of coordination between the city of Boston and the state. Um, there's a lot of coordination um, between, you know, the public health, um, our, our uh, chief of health and human services, Marty Martinez, you know, is in constant touch with the whole, the whole sort of health apparatus at the state level. Um, and there's been a lot of, of conversation back and forth around, you know, things like, things like the, um, you know, mask wearing order or other, other issues. Um, I think that, I think that what you see in the papers is real in terms of everyone feeling like there's a real gap at the federal level. I mean, that's, I feel that as just a local official, I think, I think there's a, I was saying to somebody the other day, um, there's a line in Hamilton, um, you know, where, where, where he says like the cavalry is not coming. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think there was this moment early on where everybody was waiting for like the sort of federal apparatus to swoop in the guys with jackets who say, Hey, this is what we do in this situation. Right. Like, I think that's part of our collective imaginary of a disaster. And I think, um, what has been really sobering through this is to realize that it's up to us. Like it's up to, it's up to the local and state level, you know, and I mean, I'm really proud to be from Boston. I'm proud that, you know, we've got people coming together from all different aspects of the civic community. We've got, I mean, this is the city that, you know, our labs might find the vaccine. Like we may stand up the best contact tracing operation around, right? Like we, like, you know, we've got, I mean, our food access vision just keeps expanding through this crisis, right? I mean, there's, there's a bunch of things. Um, and, you know, it's not all, it's not all certain yet. I think, for instance, I, I really want to see us push in a huge way around youth jobs this summer. I think, um, I think there's a lot of things, you know, that we, we still need to push ourselves to lead on. But, um, but I think there's a lot of people of goodwill working on that. But it is just, um, it's just a sobering reality that um, there isn't a playbook and the cavalry's not coming. Right? <laughs> All right, so as you know, we're about over about two months into this crisis. What are some of the city's greatest needs right now and what is the city working on to address those needs? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that we were just talking today in the council about, I mean, the. This, it's so funny you say, what are the greatest needs? And I think of 10 things, um, like, you know, I mean, there's the, uh, there's our whole small business ecosystem, right? And how we make sure, I mean, my greatest fear in this thing, when we talk about, you know, that level four or five, my greatest fear is that all of our small entrepreneurs just get taken out by this. And then the people who swoop in and buy everything at a discount are, you know, a handful of vulture capitalists and then suddenly you get to the other side of this thing and you know capital holdings and who owns what is more is more consolidated and more unequal than it ever was right and that to me is the nightmare the dream is we all look around and say hey work gets done by workers we've all really noticed that in a very visceral way right it's suddenly your your grocery store clerks are your frontline workers i think you know and people say, hey, given the fact that it's literally my life on the line, and given the fact that it turns out that if I don't show up, we don't have an economy, how do we have an economy that's more equitable for me, right? And I think there's this potential for more worker power and more kind of recognizing that we're all in this together um, to come out of this crisis. But, but I feel like we're on a knife's edge there. And, and it's really going to depend on, it's going to depend on political leadership, but it's really going to depend on citizen organizing. Um, and also people not, people not accepting as, as things 
as things get a little more normal, like, oh, that was a blip, right? People really holding the reality of this moment, even as we really want to be out of the darker parts of the reality of this moment. Um, so I think, I think that's really important. Sorry, this isn't directly answering your question. I, um, I think I mentioned the youth. I think thinking about the summer ahead, how we engage our young people productively um, in a way that gives them the chance for that super crucial development that happens over the summer, how we make sure we don't, I mean, don't come out of COVID with a, a learning loss gap that just sets us even further back on the, um, on the kind of opportunity and achievement gap front, you know, that's, that's huge. Um, yeah. And making our, making our workers safe, you know, I think it's definitely, um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of lives and a lot of livelihoods on the line. Um, and it's got, got, it got to be life first, but you know, we got to figure out how we, how we pick the pieces up together. Exactly. I agree with you 100% on that, you know, because life does matter. Life should come first versus anything else. Um, so and, next, it always, yeah. and, it, and it always does, right? For yeah. all, of, for all, when it's your life on the line, it always comes first, right? That's yeah. what it's important to say. Because I, I hear people saying like, oh, balance, et cetera. And I'm like, listen, like, like, I worry constantly right now about our business ecosystem and yes, like people's livelihoods. That is how it's how they put food on the table. It's how they do everything. Right. Yep. But like, but you only, you only really talk about balance when it's not your life like that we're talking about. Cause, cause the life, li the life is the first condition to having a livelihood. Right. And I just think, and as the state, you know, and I, sorry, I mean, kind of, you know, as the government, right. That's our first responsibility to the people we represent. Right. So this is a, going to the next question. It's like a two-part question. Um, what are your thoughts on the governor's reopening plan? And with that reopening plan, what do you think the voting will look like in November, you know, as Boston is preparing to manage a significant increase in absentee or mail-in ballots? Yeah, so, um, I mean, I have a lot of confidence in our election commissioner, um, Tavares and and we had a hearing on this. My colleague, Councillor Matt O'Malley, called. Um, I think that Boston Elections Department is a is a super accessible, hardworking elections department as it stands. And I think everybody gets that we've just got to kick into high high gear when it comes to early voting and mail in ballots. And and I think the city will rise that challenge. I think though we have to admit how large the challenge is. I mean, we've got. I see in my district that buildings where the voting takes place in the building that like, for instance, our elders live in, see way higher rates than the buildings around them, right? And everybody's had the same access to absentee ballots. So the question of if you, if people are afraid to use in-person voting, how you make, you know, mail-in voting as accessible as possible to people, I mean, that's going to involve a full court press. And I worry about it in a bunch of parts of the country where they don't want a full court press because they want to minimize and suppress the vote, right? And so, I mean, if anybody's got, you know, I would say if you've got a spare dollar politically this summer and fall, like spend it on voter protection, you know? I mean, just right. that, that is, that's going to be a, a huge part, a huge part of the game, unfortunately. Um, I think in Boston, we'll, we'll rise to it. Um, I wish, I wish we I wish we had not prior to the crisis agreed to have a primary on the 1st of September, a day when three quarters of our city moves traditionally. Um, right. <laughs> it's just, to me, that's, you know, um, that just adds another, another complication. Um, and yeah, and I think, um, you know, I, to me, the key thing with, the key thing with reopening is, is getting the public health piece right both because of people's lives being on the line and because that's what's going to give people the confidence, right, to go back. It's what's going to give, you could open open a business, but it's what's going to give the consumer the confidence. So to me, we need much, you know, we need to really ramp up our rapid response testing. If there's a, if there's an outbreak in some place that we've allowed to reopen, we need to be able to immediately, you know, test everybody connected, right, and kind of figure out, it's just, it's, it's how you keep it's how you keep campfires from being a forest fire, right? And like that's that's what we've got is the is the contact tracing and testing apparatus. So we've got to we've got to really amplify that. I think. Correct. Right. 
So this is where we ask a, a pretty fun question, not really, but your office has been coordinating various volunteer efforts for community members who have been less affected by the crisis to help. Can you talk about some of those volunteers' efforts? Sure. Um, yeah, well, I mentioned calling all, all through our seniors, and that's been great. And it's been amazing how many great conversations have come out of that for people. Um, and then we've been, um, we've been delivering a lot of food. Um, so the Boston Resiliency Fund, in partnership with the Office of Food Access and the um, Age Strong Commission at the city, has been putting these food boxes together for people, some of them through Greater Boston Food Bank, some through Fresh Truck, um, Katsurubis Brothers. And, and so, but with a lot of those, you know, we need a mechanism to actually get those to the folks who need them. Um, and, and, and also to figure out who needs them, right? Because the thing is, on, on the one hand, we've got a whole bunch of people who were food insecure before, and we know that, and it's important to get them food. But also there's a ton of people who were fine before, but suddenly they're stuck at home or they lost a job or they're immunocompromised and they're not on anybody's list. Right. Right. Like, and so it's interesting. The only way to actually figure that out is community. And so what, what we've been finding is, you know, we've been tapping networks of volunteers in each of the neighborhoods I represent both around identifying the people right who is it who needs food and then responding by being like okay well can you show up on tuesday and we'll get those boxes out to them um and the city also has a whole bunch of um, city workers who have moved over to delivering food so especially in the public housing developments i mean the boston police cadets are doing that the um bcyf workers are doing that um a ton of folks with the construction stoppage the like building trades laborers have done a ton of packing and delivering boxes um, but what we found is to get to get food out to people at scale, like you also need volunteers and ideally you need volunteers who know the neighborhoods. Right. And so that's what that's what we've been doing. So like my office last week partnered up with um, Rep. Jay Livingstone um, and Representative Aaron Michaelwitz and got a bunch of volunteers together. And we got nearly, I think, 600 boxes out to a whole bunch of seniors on the um you know, seniors and folks living in subsidized housing on the West End Beacon Hill side of the district, which actually has a lot more food need than people realize um because beacon hill obviously has a certain certain reputation but um but there's actually a bunch of long-term subsidized housing buildings um which i'm really proud were created 40 50 60 years ago and are still going strong um but there's a lot of food need concentrated there yes um so what else can people in the community do to help such as donate to a relief fund or organize or yeah, so I mean, I've been really impressed by the the resiliency fund in general. Just it really, I think, has done a lot to target food directly. Um, not just food, but like food, like assistance for community organizations that are low to the ground, like assistance around technology. Like it's just been it's been very effective and targeted. And so I definitely think that's a great place, the Boston Resiliency Fund, um, for folks to send their dollars. Um, I also think that everybody should be thinking of themselves as an advocate um, and you should be thinking, you know, if it's in your workplace, how do I make sure that my workplace has a plan, not just for me being safe, but for the people who work in the workplace who support me to be safe, right? If I can stay home, who doesn't get to stay home? What are our plans, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, uh, and yeah, I mean, we're going to need to organize like crazy. I think, you know, making sure, like I said, that we don't accept that we need to return to the status quo, that we really take this as a, as a clarion call to, to move forward and to end up with a, end up on the other side of it saying, you know, this was a terrible fire that we went through. Thank God that we learned in it, how much we rely on each other and how much we need to secure like the basic necessities of life and, um, and, you know, and the right to be safe and to be well to people, right? Like, I mean, that's, that, to me, that's the, that's where we've got to end up here, so. Awesome. So this is a part we have Q&A. I'm just waiting for one of my um, folks on GBYD to let me know of any questions that are being asked. So if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask and I will ask Councilor Block. Um, is there any additional information you want to share with us while we wait for questions that we roll in? Let's see. Um, I don't know. Um, well, we're having, I would say at 6 p.m. tomorrow, we're having a, um, 
public testimony hearing on the city budget. So if people have any questions or concerns related to the city budget and they want to come along um, and testify on Zoom, we'd love to have them. That's tomorrow at 6 p.m. Um, trying to think other things. Uh, I don't know. Um, I think uh, definitely, definitely, um, you know, a lot of concern at the council in general right now, I think about, about mental health and how we all, how we all work, you know, work in ways that can support each other through that and just acknowledge that I think sometimes there's a tendency to be like, well, this pandemic is happening to everybody. So it's not legitimate for me to have this acute problem myself, but it is like this pandemic is a, um, incredibly stressful thing for all of us. So just, you know, I think definitely just using the moment to say to people that if you're struggling with mental health uh, issues, you should, you know, take advantage of the fact that telehealth has been kind of allowed across the board. Mm -hmm. um, reach out to somebody if you know somebody. I think that that's something um, certainly, you know, uh, that, I, that I'm thinking a lot about lately. So that's a, that's a good thing, a good point, because we have a question that relates to that. Um, so one of the questions is, a lot of people are hurting right now, economic, economically, but also with their social well-being. What resources are available to those who are struggling right now socially and emotionally? Yeah, all right, well, that's right on target. Yeah, and I should say also, I think um, uh, Councillor Wu, Councillor Michelle Wu wrote a great op-ed about this this weekend, just taught, just acknowledging the challenges that many of us have in our families and personally um, that we're you know, and maybe we're kind of struggling to handle in normal times and then just become overwhelming um, in times like these. So I would definitely say, I think it's important for people to know that telehealth services are now available. So I know for instance, we've had, I think, I think the superintendent said yesterday that at BPS, they're um, the counselors who can provide mental health to, um, support to students have had like 2000 telehealth appointments since the beginning of the crisis. Um, and I think that's the kind of resource that doesn't always occur to people that's there. Um, and, and so your insurance should cover that, you know, even if it didn't before. So that's just one thing I think people really need to know because talking to somebody makes a difference. Um, it, it really does. Um, and then, you know, and making, um, making time, making time, go out on a walk, like cut yourself some slack. You know, I think there's a, I, I'm sorry, I don't have to hand all of the resources. Um, we actually have a whole bunch of them listed on my uh, my website. So bachforboston.org. I think we've got a whole bunch of um, uh, mental health and wellness resources there. Oh, awesome. So remember, go on her website. <laughs> <laughs> if you want any more resources. One of, the, one of the many other great websites on this front. But. Yes. Another question, uh, considering that housing, especially when has been a huge issue well before COVID-19, has there been any new initiatives regarding housing as far as like rent control, zoning reform, temporary measures like rent strikes, et cetera? Um, well, I think that the ground up measures, lots of people are talking about, and I think we're at a very interesting moment vis-a-vis um, -vis rent, because again, Right. The funny thing is, like, it's not profitable to be a landlord if your renters don't have income and they can't pay the rent. Right. And I think we're seeing that on both the residential and the commercial side right now. And again, it's an interesting conversation about the sort of interdependent relationship that we're actually all in. Um, I think I think there's some good organizing work happening around that right now. I think that on on my side, I think all the time about zoning reform, um, I one of the things that I, I worked a lot on at the Boston Housing Authority when I was there is just like the struggle to get our um, folks with vouchers housed. Um, and that's in a context where frankly, like they have a voucher that can pay market rent or pretty close in most places, which isn't true for a lot of low income folks because only a third of the people in this country who qualify for vouchers get them. Um, but even there, we just see all these barriers, um, explicit discrimination barriers, and then just barriers related to administration and lack of um, lack of available apartments. And so um, that's something I, as I've transitioned into the counselor role, I've continued to work with the BHA on. Um, and uh, 
they actually have a big initiative they've announced this week around trying to get more landlords to rent to voucher holders. Um, but the, you know, the long term, the long term solution there is how do you just get? I mean, you know, how do you get more project based voucher units? How do you like? How do we move back to a world where we build new public housing units? Like, how do we? You know, I mean, we just have to. Um, we need we need more housing that isn't just affordable, but is secure. So people talk a lot about like what's affordable and different income brackets. And that's an important conversation and you can't have a viable community if you don't have that whole spectrum, right? Of, of housing at different prices. But the really key thing about the mechanisms like public housing and vouchers that we don't talk enough about is that they the rent you pay is 30% of your income, right? which provides an incredible degree of security in a crisis like this. Mm -hmm. Because if you like, if, if you have a voucher, you live in public housing and you just lost your job and your income went way down, you can recertify and pay a lower rent. Right. And sometimes when we talk about what, what rents get set, like it can be good to get some apartments set at a lower rent, but it still might be a rent that's totally unaffordable to somebody if they get hit with a medical crisis or a loss of job or something else. Um, And I just think like, in general, to stabilize our communities, we need to be looking for more opportunities to to get people into predictable um, rent structures where they can plan, they can plan their lives and do all the things they do to, to build up our communities. Right. Um, another question, can you discuss the city of Boston's plan for contract tracing? Yeah, so I am not enough of, I, I'm not enough of an expert and I w- don't want to mislead anybody. So I will say, um, so it's really, what I know is this, we have an incredible set of public health nurses at the Boston um, Public Health Commission who have been working from the beginning of this crisis. And I think that's important for people to know because not every city and town in Massachusetts, in fact, very few have the infrastructure to do this, but Boston has had public health nurses calling and following up and contact tracing, um, you know, to the greatest extent possible with our cases, like from, from the beginning of this crisis. And so, and so as the state sort of launches its thousand person hires and thinks about, you know, how to set up a statewide system, they're counting on BPHC to be part of that. Um, and the good thing is that that's something where that CARES Act money we were talking about before can come in so we can, we can grow that program. Um, and I know a couple of people that, you know, who have joined the force at BPHC as public health, like nurses, people have come back from retirement. It's a very all hands on deck approach right now. Um, so Boston is definitely going to be a big piece of the statewide effort. And, you know, and that's important because as, as folks probably know, but maybe don't, you know, we're the city of Boston is 10% of Massachusetts population, right? So that's, that's why it's, it's always really important what we're doing at the city level, even when we talk about state level stuff. Awesome. So that's all the questions we have for today. Um, Again, thank you for meeting with me and sharing your story and let us know what the city is doing. Um, Any last words? (laughs) Uh, No, just um, thanks so much for having me. And I'm glad to hear you're on Spark. I guess the thing I'd say to people is, um, you know, I, uh, I'm a city councilor now. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was, you know, I was on the Spark Council. Um, I was just uh, organizing a campaign, standing outside in the rain, talking to thousands of Bostonians about um, about the Community Preservation Act and why we should pass that. And so I just would say the for those, you know, for the sort of Greater Boston Young Dems world, that that line between being an, an activist and being the position that I'm in now is really very thin. So, yeah. um, you know, so I'm grateful for all that you guys, that you guys do. And, and yeah, maybe someday I'll be interviewing you, Latia. Yes, I'm with it, I'm, I'm for it. <laughs> but thank you again, it was a pleasure speaking with you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so much, Councilor. No, thank you, really appreciate having me. You're welcome, no problem. Bye. <laughs>